Greetings to everyone. This is Federico B. De La Peña, a part-time professor here in Mapu University. And I finished, or rather my credential is an engineering geology from the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. All right. Today we will discuss pollution sources and drinking water protection. Hmm. And these are the objectives of this lecture. First is the types and sources of common water pollutants. <clears throat> Second is how these pollutants impact drinking water resources. Third is what are the drinking water standards that are relevant relative to these pollution to these uh, pollutants. And fourth is what are the treatment methods that can be done to mitigate these pollution or these pollutants. <clears throat> All right. To introduce. Uh, we have to take note that drinking drink, drinking water or our drinking water source comes from two main sources. One is your surface water such as rivers, lakes or streams. And you also have your subsurface source which is your groundwater pump from water wells. All right. And you have to take note that uh, these water sources are treated differently. For example, surface water typically has to be treated. Okay. Surface water is uh, typically in contact with pollu pollution sources like agricultural wastes. Uh, industrial wastes and other stuff that is di directly discharged to your uh, river networks. And then, or on the other hand, you have your groundwater, which is in the subsurface and is in general protected by your deep water aquifers. So, as you can imagine, uh, contaminated or polluted water for them to reach your groundwater they have to travel deep and they have to travel through layers and layers of sediments which naturally tend to filter or which tend to naturally filter pollutants so therefore, most groundwater wells have no need for addition, additional treatment. Okay. Yeah. And most common pollutants have an effect on surface water, including industrial, agricultural, and municipal discharges. So I'll just clarify here the term municipal discharges. So municipal discharges refers to your <coughs> domestic discharges. Like um, wastewater from the houses. Okay. So municipal discharge doesn't just doesn't mean you're to, just talking about uh, municipal uh, municipal units. This could refer to cities, rural, rural areas, and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Moving on. We have this term called maximum contaminant level goals. Okay, so this is a term from US EPA. And this is about, or rather, this MCLG refers to your level of contaminants in the drinking water at which no adverse health effects, health effects are, are likely to occur. In short, this is the level of contaminant in your drinking water that is acceptable okay, 
on the basis of uh, health con health effects. <clears throat> so the maximum amount of contact of pollutant that won't kill you. Okay. To simplify things. Or give you a disease. Now we also have um, maximum contaminant levels. <clears throat> So MCL. So MC. So this is just set as close as possible to the MCLGs as possible, considering cost, benefits, and ability of, the, of public water systems to detect and remove contaminants using suitable treatment technologies. <clears throat> now MCL is essentially just MCLG. Once you factor in economics and yeah, basically economics and technology. Okay, so for example, you set a certain number for arsenic. So that's your MCLG. You set like a very small number, but you found out that your existing technology is not really uh, it's too expensive so the existing technology to reach those MCLG is too expensive so you, and so you might have to settle with a with a bigger uh, contaminant level because that's what you can only afford Okay, so MCLG is the ideal contaminant level. MCL is what is is your is the contaminant is the maximum contaminant level once you uh, factor in the economics of your situation. Alex, you'll uh, see the more examples later. Okay, so MCL may be higher than MCLG. Why? Because economics okay? some you just sometimes can't afford the technologies that can bring down the contaminant levels to your MCLG All right <clears throat> now these are your common drinking water contaminant groups <clears throat> you have your microorganisms which include E. coli and viruses and these typically come from human and animal wastes and then you also have your disinfectants and disinfection byproducts these include your chlorines acids and these typically come from disinfection uh, facilities or water disinfection facilities Okay, like your water treatment plants <clears throat> and then you also have your inorganic chemicals so inorganic chemicals these are your compounds which do not contain carbon so these are your arsenic chromium lead nitrate or chlorate and these can come from either natural or industrial or industrial sources <clears throat> And you also have your organic chemicals. Uh, these include your um, volatile organic contaminants such as your gasoline. You also have your synthetic organic contaminants. And last you have your radionuclides. And <clears throat> This include radium, uranium, and radon. Okay. But for this lecture, we will just focus on the common uh, drinking water contaminants, uh, which are your inorganic chemicals orga and organic chemicals and other subgroups which are of emerging concern. Okay. <clears throat> okay.
Now let's talk about organic contaminants. Common organic contaminants found in drinking water include fluorinated hydrocarbons and non-fluorinated hydrocarbons. Fluorinated hydrocarbons include PCE and PCE. And then non-fluorinated hydrocarbons associated with petroleum fuel products include benzene and MTBE. Uh, we will discuss all these species, uh, these compounds later on. And then, since these are typical small organic compounds, so these are these compounds typically have a small um, small molecules and have relatively high vapor pressure. So these things tend to easily vaporize when exposed to the atmosphere. Uh, they are classified as volatile organic com compounds or VOCs. VOCs can be removed by either an aeration process or activated carbon absorption. Alright, so let's talk about the benzene and BTEX. Okay, which are under the organic contaminants. Most, or, most underground storage tanks or USDs for petroleum products were installed before the 1980s and are typically made of bare steel. Okay, so these are just uh, plain steel with uh, minimal uh, corrosion protection. So they so they're uh, highly susceptible to corrosion over time, and they tend to leak. And there's where, that's where your problem begins. <clears throat> uh, you have leaks from your underground underground storage tanks. <clears throat> benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and silenes are often referred collectively by the acronym BTEX. <clears throat> BTEX together constitute up to 20% of the composition of your gasoline. Okay, so this is a major co component of your gasoline uh, product. Okay, and benzene is also used to make plastics, resins, nylon, synthetic fibers, rubbers, lubricants, dyes, detergents, drugs, and pesticides. Okay, so <clears throat> the benzene is more or less a widely used <clears throat> um, industrial component for making uh, plastics and synthetics. Also, long-term exposure to benzene can cause anemia Decrease in blood platelets and increased risk of cancer. On the other hand, toluene may, may affect the nervous system and cause kidney or liver problems. <clears throat> and then ethyl benzene may cause kidney or liver problems, and silenes may cause nervous system damage. Okay, so these are uh, more or less. Uh, really serious um, health effects and <clears throat> BDEX is prone to volatilization and but it's also biodegradable under aerobic conditions in soil and groundwater. Now we have to take note that <clears throat> aerobic conditions mean you have oxygen Okay, so as long as you have oxygen in your soil and groundwater, you can expect your BTEX to biodegrade with the help of your uh, your bacteria friends. Okay, as long as you give them oxygen, they'd be happy to break to break down your BTEX for you, <clears throat> which we will talk about later, and I think in the next slide. Now below is a table showing the 
MCL and the MCLG for benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and silenes. As you can see for benzene, the MCLG for benzene is 0, 0 parts per, per million or milligram per liter. Uh, these are the same. But of course, as technology permits, the practical number is actually 0 0.005 parts per million in your drinking water. And then for toluene, you basically have the same MCLG and M same MCL, so one part per million. And you also have ethyl benzene, also the same MCLG and MCL, at 0.7 parts per million. And last, your silenes, okay, again the same, you have 10 parts per million for MCL and MC. LG. <clears throat> All right. BTEX contaminated soils in okay. The remediation for them include dig and haul or basically basically excavation. You excavate the whole contaminated soil. Or you also you can also try soil vapor extraction, and, and then you can also try bio venting. By far, soil vapor extraction or SVE is the most commonly employed method, while digging or excavation can be expensive unless you are dealing with a small volume of soil that is um, contaminated. SVE involves extracting gasoline vapor from the subsurface via extraction wells with a vacuum blower. BTEX contaminated groundwater include pump and peat, air sparging, and bioremediation. Okay, so just to repeat, uh, when you're dealing with a BTEX BTEX contaminated soil, you either dig it or you do an SVE or you do bioventing. But if you're dealing with a contaminated groundwater, you have to pump either do a pump and treat, air sparging, or bioremediation. Now, the figure on the right shows a diagram of. <clears throat> of an SVE method. Okay. As you can see you have in your in the left part of your of your figure you have a well. Okay, you have, or a, uh, you have a well in there that is probing deep into your soil. And that well is hooked with a vacuum pump. So the vacuum pump basically draws out your soil vapors. And the soil vapors are directed to the surface and and led to the to your vapor treatment unit, which typically combusts your BTEX or okay to remove the um, contaminant. <clears throat> the next group of organic contaminants are your MTBE or what we call the methyl tert butyl ether. Okay, so MTBE has been used extensively as an additive in gasoline to reduce air pollution and enhance octane ratings. Okay. So if you're if you're a fan of high octane gas, chances are uh, the gas you're using has MTBE. <clears throat> 
And MPB typically comprises 11% of gasoline. And due to its high, high water solubility, relative to gasoline hydrocarbons, MPB is more likely to be leached into groundwater or in infiltration. So MTBE, the problem with it is it has a high solubility, meaning it can easily um, mix with water. Okay, once it spills, it can easily uh, mix with water once it reaches your groundwater. And it can basically uh, easily travel okay, through the subsurface and spread out. <clears throat> Typical or possible sources of MTBE in groundwater include leaking, ground, un leaking underground fuel tanks, pipelines, tank overfilling. So basically when, you, when people tend to overfill their tanks with gasoline, you also have faulty construction at gas stations, spillage from vehicle accidents, and releases of uh, gasoline from homes. UE, UESPA has no MCL or MCLG due to insufficient data okay, for, for MPBE. <clears throat> Although the state of California has a primary MCL of 13 micro micrograms per liter or 13 parts per billion. <clears throat> Remedi remediation methods are same to those using the BTEX. <clears throat> okay, now, now we have a figure on your right. Uh, this one shows the bioventing method. As you can see, you have a, again, you have a well that uh, is installed deep underground and your well is connected to a blower which delivers or injects air to the subsurface at at, lo at at a rather low rate okay and this one helps uh, stimulate biodegradation while minimizing volatilization. Okay. My apologies. <clears throat> Let's talk about the trichloroethylene or TCE. TCE is, wild, is widely used as an industrial solvent for the degreasing and cleaning of metals textile cleaning and solvent extraction process. <clears throat> so TCE has a variety of uses. And in surface waters, TCE tends to volatilize while degradation occurs slowly in groundwater by microbial action. <clears throat> there is a 1 in 1 million cancer risk for drinking water exposure of between 0.1 to 64 parts per billion over a lifetime, where a lifetime is approximately 70 years. <clears throat> the UESPA MCL is 5 parts per billion. Alright, and then the remediation or um, mitigation methods for TCE is by the use of packed tower aer aeration or PTA and granular activated carbon or GAC. Although in some cases air stripping is actually more cost effective than PTA or GAC. Now you have a, a figure on your right. This one shows a PTA or a packed tower aeration method. In here you have a you essentially have a tower 
that holds in that has a matrix in the middle you can see the green yeah, you can see uh, some green colored balls in, inside and what happens here is your contaminated water is injected from the top okay, it's injected from the top and it trickles down your packing okay so as it, as your water uh, goes through your your pack you get to increase the surface area of your water and at the same time you have been, you have air going in from the bottom and the air is directed upward okay in the process your air actually <clears throat> air interacts with your uh, water and this packs and they it tends to remove your volatile uh, materials like your PCE as it exits your tower all right now let's talk about orga inorganic sorry inorganic contaminants uh, these are your mineral based compounds and your inorganic contaminants occur naturally Although they can also come from, of course, your anthropogenic and your industrial processes like farming, chemical manufacturing, industrial discharge, and other human activities. And we also have to note that you have a lot of inorganic compounds that are necessary for our body functions. Although some of course, excess amounts are typically uh, lethal or toxic. Okay, and you will see later on which uh, some of these examples. All right, let's talk about arsenic. Arsenic is a naturally occurring element. Okay, this is. <clears throat> And the main commercial use of arsenic in the United States is in pesticides, mostly herbicides and wood preservatives. Erosion of rocks and minerals is believed to be the primary source of naturally occurring arsenic found in drinking water supplies and in soil. So at least again, <clears throat> in here, you have to note that most of the arsenic that we find we find in the in our drinking water supplies okay most of them actually come from natural from natural sources like due to like erosion of your soil and you also have your anthropogenic sources of arsenic like from mining um Processing of non ferrous metals like copper, smelting, wastewater, pesticides, treated wood, sewage sludge, coal, coal fired power plants, urban runoff, and atmospheric deposition. <clears throat> Long term exposure to arsenic to drinking water is associated with cancer of lungs, bladder, skin, liver, and kidneys. U.S. EPA's arsenic rule established an MCL of 10 parts per billion and an MCLG of zero. Now, the photo on your right is not a victim of arsenic poisoning. Okay, so this girl, her name is Rosalia Lombardo from Italy. She lived between 1918 to 1920, which is a short life. Uh, this girl... So she died at two years old, and her father wanted her preserved. So he took his daughter to a famous embalmer in Italy. And what the embalmer did is he used the arsenic 
to preserve uh, Rosalia. Okay. And I think this photo was taken in the modern times. Okay. So that's powerful. That's how it, it only shows how powerful Arsenic is as a preservative. Okay. All right. All right. Let's talk about uh, the chemical nature of arsenic. You have two forms of arsenic. In your natural waters, you have your arsenite, which is ASO2 or AS3, and arsenate, which is ASO4 or ASV. Okay. Now, uh, arsenate is actually more easily removed from source waters than arsenite. So, <clears throat> and to convert arsenite, you have to oxidize your arsenite in order to obtain arsenate. And we typically use a chemical oxidant like chlorine. Okay. And what we typically use to remove uh, arsenic in water is to do precipitation or co-precipitation. Okay, so we try to precipitate um, affiliated metals that can precipitate together with arsenic. Okay, so the high, relatively high technology is used for Removal of arsenic include uh, permeable reactive barriers, biological treatment, phytoremediation, and electrokinetic treatment. Now the photo on your on your left is a drawing showing phytoremediation. Basically, use a plant okay, that has a, that has an affinity to your Typically, to metals, particularly arsenic, and your plants basically draw out, draw out and consume or store your uh, metals, effectively removing it from the soil. Now, the next group we will talk about. Uh, lead and copper. Lead and copper are primarily present at tap, at tap water due to corrosion of lead and copper based materials in home plumbing. Okay. Corrosion here involves electrochemical interaction between a, between a metal surface such as pipe wall or solder and water. <coughs> Although we have to uh, take note here that corrosion can be inhibited by scale formation. So I'm basically talking about here the scum that tends to accumulate in our bathroom walls and uh, pipes. Okay, So these uh, scales are typically carbonate uh, deposits and scale actually tends to prevent or inhibit uh, corrosion. Okay. And sometimes actually some uh, water treatment plants actually or deliberately um, treat the water such that the water will actually be prone to scale formation okay, because uh, scale of course protects your pipe water systems okay. so <clears throat> yeah it's pretty normal to have a uh, hard water okay. anyway uh, lead commonly 
contaminates drinking water in pre-1986 era houses which have brass or chrome-plated brass faucets and fixtures which typically have a lead solder. Okay. Alright, the photo on your left is a Roman era lead pipe. So what they used before in their plumbing is, uh, of course, is, is lead. And actually, historians suspect that some of the um, violent events in Roman history, okay, some historians speculate that these are due to lead poisoning. Okay. Of their um, politicians or, or and citizens. <clears throat> All right, lead is persistent. Okay, so we have to know that it's a persistent uh, metal. It can bioaccumulate in the body over time, and it's, it is definitely toxic even at low levels of exposure. Okay, because even taking up small amounts of lead. Okay. If you, if you just take a small amount of lead, what happens here is the lead just stays in your body unless a bigger predator eats you. Okay, like, I don't know, a lion eats you or you die early. Okay, so unless you get eaten as a young human or you die early as a human, Okay, you won't have problems with that. But of course, the tip, it's typically humans typically live for seventy years or more. So if you're consuming uh, lead, even in small amounts, the tendency is the lead will just stay in your body and accumulate over time, and eventually it gets it can uh, reach levels that are lethal or toxic to your your body. Okay, so instead of setting MCLs, EPA established action levels for lead at 15 parts per billion and copper at uh, 1.3 parts per million. So we have to note that lead causes damage to the nerve system. It also causes learning disabilities, shorter stature, impaired hearing, and damage to blood to blood cells. <clears throat> Another um, simple way to mitigate uh, contamination of your water by lead and copper is to typically just flush the stagnant water out of your faucet in the morning before using it of course uh, this uh, helps flush out all the contaminated water and it also helps reduce the the um, the use of water that has, has, has been in contact with your pipes for a long period of time. The next group is your nitrate and nitrite. Nitrates or NO3 <clears throat> and nitrites NO2 are the two of the oxygen or rather nitrogen oxygen compounds that are used by plants and animals. Bacteria in soil and plants use oxygen to change nitrite into more stable nitrate. While plants use nitrate as an essential nutri nutrient. And your major sources of nitrates in, in drinking water are typically from fertilizer use, uh, leaking from septic tanks, yuck. sewage, and erosion of natural deposits. Okay, in your right is a 
sack of ammonium nitrate. Okay. So ammonium nitrate is typically used as fertilizer. Although if you mix ammonium nitrate with fuel oil, you can make you can make dynamite or ammonium nitrate. Typically called as ANPO or ammonium nitrate and fer fertilizer uh, and fuel oil. Okay. Anyway, human exposure to nitrates and nitrites results primarily from ingestion, particularly from vegetables and cured meats. <laughs> So if you're eating vegetables that were not washed washed properly, okay, if they still have their um, nitrate fertilizer, and you just <clears throat> not properly wash your vegetables, okay, so you're, you're definitely uh, ingesting nitrates. For cured meats like bacon, sausages, eh, I mean, nitrates are uh, typically used in processed uh, meats. One one known adverse effect of um, exposure to nitrate and nitrites is the methemoglobinemia, which is a disease known for causing cyan cyano cyanosis. So in this disease, uh, your skin turns blue. Okay. Now the MCL and the MCLG for nitrate as ox as nitrogen is ten parts per million. For nitrite, nitrogen, and One parts per million for nitrate nitrogen and ten parts per million for joint nitrate nitrite in drinking water. Treatment methods effective for removing nitrate below ten milligrams per liter or ten parts per million include ion exchange, reverse osmosis, and electrodialysis. Here on your left. Okay, can you guess what's the method shown in your left? Okay, that's reverse, reverse osmosis. <clears throat> okay, as you can see on the left side of the diagram, you have untreated water that is under pressure. Okay, and your water is forced through a sem semi-permeable membrane. To purify your water. The next group is your perchlorate. <coughs> perchlorate is an oxidizing chemical used in a variety of industrial processes, including explosive and fireworks. As you can see in your right. You have a missile launcher. This okay, so perchlorate is also widely used in as a compound used in rocket propellant. <coughs> Toxic mechanism of perchlorate, sorry, is a reduction in iodide uptake into your thyroid. So what happens here is we don't you don't get enough iodide. In your thyroid, your thyroid tends to underproduce uh, it, okay, Under, underproduce hormones, and this can lead to hypothyroidism. There is no US EPA drinking water standard for perchlorate, although the state of California has set a MC, an MCL of six parts. Six parts per billion for perchlorate. <clears throat> now let's talk about the contaminants of emerging concern or C C E C or C E C S sex. <laughs> uh, 
CEC CECs comprise several se several groups of chemicals recently detected in the water supply. <clears throat> okay, so take note that some of these chemicals are actually not new. Okay, the only thing that changed here is they have been recently detected. So maybe there was a new technology that popped up that helped detect these uh, chemicals or okay, or some just some other study just um, happened to do a study about these groups of chemicals. Now the main highlight in C in CECs is they have limited data and US EPA has not established any MCLs for CECs. Okay, so it's not just actually not just the US EPA uh, CECs are mostly uh, under their are uh, like hardly under the radar of um, environmental organizations. Okay, they're just merging. Sorry. So there are actually a lot of uh, CECs. Okay. I think there are like hundreds of CECs that I'll be discussing like just four of them. Okay, four of the most uh like the major CECs. <clears throat> So let's talk about hexavalent chromium. Okay, so hexavalent chromium, uh, it's uh, when you're talking about chromium, you have you, you're actually think, talking about two states of chromium. Okay, you have your trivalent chromium or CR3, and your hexavalent chromium or, C, or CR6. So hexavalent chromium is more water soluble and it more easily enters uh, human living cells and it's actually more toxic, even carcinogenic compared to the trivalent chromium. On the other hand, trivalent chromium is an essential trace element in the human diet. Okay, so you can see here the dichotomy between the trivalent and the hexavalent form. Okay, so you have an evil twin here that is water soluble, easily enters your cells, toxic and carcinogenic. While the good twin here, your trivalent chromium, is an essential is an essential trace element in your human diet. So yeah, your your body actually needs trivalent chromium. <clears throat> okay, so so hexavalent chromium, chromium is an exception in the CECs because US EPA actually has an MCL. Okay, so for CR3 and CR6, so combined trivalent and hexavalent chromium, the MCL is 100. Micro, micrograms per liter or 100 parts per billion. However, you have your state of California that is trying to actually lower the MCL for hexavalent chromium to 10 parts per billion. Now, what's disturbing here is the is that the rivers in the United States have been have been found to have to have chromium ranging from one to thirty micro, micrograms per liter or one to thirty parts per billion. Okay, that's actually okay. So it doesn't say if it's uh, hexavalent or trivalent, but uh, thirty parts per billion is definitely bigger than the MCL of California at 10 parts per billion. Okay. Uh, now, if you want to remove uh, hexavalent chromium in your drinking water, 
the typical method series star weak base anion exchange or WBA, strong base anion exchange, and reduction coagulation filtration or RCBF. <clears throat> Another group of your CECs is your 1, 2, 3 trichloropropane or TCP. This one is an anthropogenic industrial chemical and a pesticide byproduct. <clears throat> now, based on a study uh, showing formation of multiple tumors in animals, TCP is classified by the US EPA as slightly, as slightly carcinogenic. To humans, sorry, likely to be carcinogenic to humans. Uh, there is no federal MCL for TCP, although Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, has established an MCL of 0 0.6 micro micrograms per liter. <clears throat> in the United States, TCP has been detected in many surface waters and drinking water sources at levels ranging from 0.1 to 100 mi micrograms per liter, which is again way over the uh, MCL of 0.6 micrograms per liter. Okay. So this one is definitely a, a compound of concern. <clears throat> All right, another characteristic of uh, TCP is it is typically persistent in the groundwater due to its long hydro hydrolysis half-life and its low biodegradability. Currently, granular activated carbon or GAC is the only viable treatment option for TCP removal. Okay, so the figure on your right is a... GAC filter or a granular activated carbon filter. So GAC works by the concept of, of sorption. A sorption means uh, you have particles like air, liquid, or solid sticking on on the surface area of a solid particle. Okay, so sorption is all about a solid particle, or rather, you have any form of any phase of contaminant that is sticking or adhering to the surface area of your uh, solid particles, like like uh, activated carbon. All right. All right. Uh, the next CEC is your one four dioxane. Uh, I think the girls here, sorry, no, I mean, everyone here should pay attention to this CEC. One for dioxane, or also called dioxane, is a synthetic industrial solvent used mainly as a stabilizer in chlorinated solvents. It is used in many products, including paint strippers, dyes, Greases, varnishes, and waxes. <clears throat> it is also found as an impurity in antifreeze and aircraft dyes and fluids, as well as in some consumer products like deodorants, shampoos, and cosmetics. And the IR or the the IR class classified 1,4 dioxane as a group B2 carcinogen or a probable human carcinogen. So, as you can see in the figure on your left, okay, 1,4 dioxane, you can typically find it in your laundry detergent, shower gels, dish soaps, uh, shampoo, body wash. And if you want to avoid 1,4 dioxane, you may want to avoid products that have chemicals ending in ETH and chemicals that are under the PEGs. <clears throat> All right. The World Health Organization suggested a 
See, so it's just a suggestion at the moment. A an MCL of 50 micrograms per liter for 1,4 dioxine. 1,4 dioxine is highly, highly mobile and is recalcitrant to microbial biodegrad microbial degradation and has a low tendency to volatilize from water. Advanced oxidation process or AOPs have been shown to be effective for removing 1,4 dioxine. Now your last group is your PF OA and PFOS, uh, which stand for perflu perfluoro octanoic acid and perfluoro perfluoro per perfluor octane sulfonate, which are both under the group of compounds of perfluoro. Per Perfluoro alkyl substances or PFAS. Okay, so this lot of fucking uh, <laughs> fucking tongue twisters. Uh, PFAS are used in firefighting foams, coating for food packaging, Scotch guard or a spray for fabric protection, and Teflon. Okay, so these are your so most most of these are your everyday items. PFAS are soluble in water, and exposure to it can occur through use of products or consumption of food or water containing PFAS. Okay, so PFO and PFOS both cause tumors in rats as per chronic toxicology studies. <clears throat> so if you would look at your uh, left figure, you have um, you have a diagram showing the typical occurrence of PFAS in fast food containers. Okay. So dessert and bread wrappers, okay, typical are the most uh, likely to have PFAS, and then your Burger and sandwich wrappers and paperboard. Okay, these all tend to have a significant amount of PFAS. And your paper cups, okay, they typically don't have uh, PFAS. Okay. Right. <clears throat> now, how do we uh, mitigate PFAS? Okay. So of course it's a likely human carcinogen and uh, PFAS has been detected like everywhere, like all types of waters, like surface water, groundwater, tap water, bottled waters, waste waters, industrial waste waters, rivers, lakes, and tributaries. Okay, so they're fucking everywhere, and the most effective treatment technologies for removing PFAS appear to be nanofiltration and reverse osmosis. Okay, so let's look at the figure on the left. Uh, this chart shows the filtration power of your uh, different um, filtration methods. Okay, so Reverse osmosis is your actually mo your most um, potent uh, filtration method. It can remove uh, particles smaller than one nanometer. So these include ions, even viruses and bacteria. Then you have your nanofiltration, which can go as small as one nanometer. And then your ultrafiltration, which is up to or can filter particles as small as 10 nanometers. 
and then your microfiltration which can filter out particles as small as 100 nanometers. Alright, that concludes uh, this lecture. This lecture was based on the book um, Fundamentals of Environmental Site Assessment and Remediation by uh, Rong Yue, 2018 by CRC Press. <clears throat>